Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Black Hawk Automotive Museum. My name is Tim McGrain. I'm the executive director of the museum. Um, on behalf of the entire team at the museum, thank you for coming out this morning, today I should say, uh, for our very special presentation. Before we get started, I would like to do a couple of flag-waving opportunities for the museum. Um, each year the museum hosts a Father's Day car show, um, June 15th this year. Those who of us who are going to um, for Father's Day car show, um, please either pick up information before you leave, go to our website. Um, if you are a father, you get in free on Father's Day. Um, so bring your kid, come along. If you are a kid, bring your dad. <laughs> um, uh, our, our catering company also hosts uh, a Father's Day brunch, actually here in this area where you're seated now. So you could actually spend the entire, entire day at the plaza um, and not go hungry and not go thirsty and, and not be too far away from great cars. Um, we also do a couple of other activities during the course of the year, and we have one coming up uh, that we're doing in association with, with our friends that do the Sonoma Motorsports, Historic Motorsports Festival in June out at Sonoma Raceway. Um, Steve Earle has been a longtime friend of the museum, and uh, what we're doing on the Saturday of that weekend, we're getting about 40 or 50 car owners together to do a drive from here out to um, the racetrack, um, and the good people at the Audi Sports Car Experience have allowed us to use their facility, which is on the inside of Turn 2, both of us a gathering spot to watch the races. And for those of you who sign up, there will be some lap opportunities during the lunchtime race session. Um, don't get your driver's shoes out, don't get your driver's suit out, they're controlled laps. <laughs> um, another thing we do, for those of you who may not be aware, um, we do a small gathering on the first Sunday of each month, we call it Cars and Coffee. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> it happens between, officially it happens between 8 and 10, rain or shine, year round. Um, the first people have a tendency to show up about 6.15 in the morning. Um, uh, we started it, this past month was, was our first anniversary. Uh, we started it last April to do an outreach for the museum um, to bring car enthusiasts uh, to the plaza, to the museum. Um, this past month, we were fortunate enough to have a wonderful turnout. Mother Nature was on our side. Uh, we stopped counting at 627 cars. <laughs> there were more, we just don't know where they parked. So anyway, um, if you like this event, if you like the events we do, if you like the cars in the museum, or if you just think what we do is a good idea, please consider becoming a member of the museum. Um, uh, we have um, different activities during the course of the year, um, and membership does have its benefits. You do get a preferred rate, um, and you can make a difference. You know, every member that we have is important to us. If you are already a member, thank you, but don't stop there. Think about giving one to a friend, a colleague, um, an employee, anything like that. So please keep that in mind. Um, our speaker today needs no introduction from me, but I would like to share with you um, a quick overview of some of the many accomplishments he's had. Involved with competition, racing cars, and photography, since he went to his first road race at Pebble Beach in 1951, and in 1952, saw Phil Hill um, drive a wild MGTC special. He was hooked for life. While in high school, he won class honors twice at the Oakland National Roadster Show with cars he designed and built himself. After competing high school, he attended Stanford University, but would soon head to Southern California to follow his true passion, cars. Unconventionally, he got accepted into the famed Art Center College of Design, Los Angeles, where he studied automotive design under the noted car designer, Strother McMinn. Short on tuition money, he contacted GM's Chuck Jordan for a job, and at age 19, would become the youngest designer ever hired by the automaker. He was fortunate enough to work for both design giants, Harley Earl and Bill Mitchell. He ultimately sketched what Mitchell chose as for the direction of what would become the 1963 Corvette Stingray. Creating full-size clay models of the Stingray in 1957. We'll be hearing about his time at GM today. Becoming restless at the anti-performance period at GM, and at age 21, old enough to get his SCCA driver's license, he headed back to California to become a race car driver. 
While working at Max Belchowski's famed Hollywood Motors, he became acquainted with Carol Shelby and went on to become Shelby's first employee. As Shelby and Merican involved their Cobra program, he would create the design of the Cobra Daytona Coupe that would go on to win the 1965 FIA World Championship, World Sports Car Championship, in a dominant manner and the first American constructor to win the international title. In 1965, he started BRE, offering design services and raced import cars from manufacturers like Hino, Toyota, and in 1968, for Triumph's competition department with the TR250K, a car that we had here in the museum a number of years, and then for Datsun. By early 1970s, BRE were winning SCCA national championships with the Datsun 240Z, and Trans Am Series championships with the Datsun 510, to a point that other manufacturers were declining to race. In 1973, he entered the world of hang gliding and spent a decade building ultra-right products into the largest hang gliding company in the world and developing the sport of long-distance hang gliding competition. His first passion eventually called him back, returning to the Art Center College Pasadena as an instructor. He is a motorsports photographer, an award-winning author of books on both the Corvette and the Shelby Daytona Coupe. His many accolades include Lifetime Achievement Awards from the International Society for Vehicle Preservation and the Art Center College of Design, along with recently receiving the Phil Hill Award from the Road Racing Drivers Club for recognizing his contributions to the sport of road racing. This year, the 1964 Shelby Daytona Coupe he designed is the very first automobile to be included in the permanent archives of the Library of Congress. In an interview with Jay Leno, Leno exclaimed, before I met you, I knew what you had done. I thought you were 117 years old. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, will you please put your hands together and give a very warm welcome to the gentleman who is, first and foremost, a car designer, Mr. Peter Brock. Tim, thank you uh, so much. Can you all hear me? All right, now we're looking. Sound very... That was such an impressive, I was looking around to see who that would be. It certainly couldn't be me with all those things. I don't know how I got all those things jammed in all those years, but uh, I've had a, a great ride. I've really enjoyed all the neat things that I've happened to do. And, and uh, being here at the Blackhawk is certainly a, a pinnacle. This is the most beautiful venue that I've had a chance to speak with. And, and uh, meeting all the Corvette enthusiasts out there, I had a chance to walk around and meet some of you and talk a little bit about your cars. And it was... It, it's been, it's been really great, so thank you. I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, a short period of history, which is really my start in, uh, in working in, uh, in automotive design. And none of you would be here today if it wasn't for one man at uh, General Motors who literally single-handedly saved the Corvette. I mean, it was gonna go away. And if it hadn't have been for Bill Mitchell, and I'll be telling you a little bit about that. If it hadn't been for Bill, we wouldn't have any Corvettes. Uh, the whole sports car market and uh, the whole scene of uh, automotive uh, excitement that we have in this country would, would never exist. So uh, anyway, I had a chance to work at, uh, at GM with, uh, with four of the giants, uh, the guys that really, really made made the Corvette and made General Motors what it was. When Harley Earl came up with the idea of, of uh, doing the Corvette, uh, which was introduced at the Waldorf Art Story in 53, it, it was a result of his trip to Watkins Glen in 1951. And he had already done the, the LeSabre, uh, which you'll see a picture of. Uh, that was sort of the American idea of what a, a sports car should be, but nobody really in Detroit really understood what a sports car should be. Um, if you've ever been back in the Midwest, it's totally flat. The road is straight as far as you can see, and uh, the whole idea of driving for fun had not really uh, permeated the uh, the 
Detroit establishment in mind. But uh, Harley Will uh, Earl went to, uh, went to Watkins Glen, saw what was going on with the early cars that were coming back, mostly MGs that were racing around at that time. And at the same time in, in 1951, I was attending my first road race uh, down at Pebble Beach. And if you'll see a little later in my book, uh, a lot of the photographs that I took at that time are in the book. And that's when I really got excited about automotive design. I worked for uh, Bill Breeze over at the Sports Car Center in the Sausalito area and got started there. So here's Harley Earl in, in, uh, at Watkins Glen in 1951 and myself over at Pebble Beach as a young kid getting really enthralled with automobiles. And little did I know that those two names had come together at some point and I'd have a chance to work for the great man who really started this whole thing. And his idea really in doing the, the whole Corvette program was not so much that they were going to come out with a, a new car, but he really wanted to test this idea of low cost tooling because everything that permeates everything in Detroit is not designed as much as we the designers would like it to be. It's the bottom line. Those are the guys that determine what things are going to be. And there are many, many compromises made in automotive design simply because of cost. And unfortunately, the Corvette was on the chopping block. It had not been a very successful idea. This whole idea of doing a car in fiberglass just wasn't making it. But Ford was really had the better idea, and they came out because the uh, first Corvettes, I think we built three or 400 of them in 54. Ford answered with this car in 55, and it was obviously a real hit. I mean, it was something the American public understood. It was all made out of metal. It had roll up and down windows. It was comfortable. Uh, it was a, a personal car. And surprisingly, Virgil Exner over at Chrysler was doing some very, very exciting cars at that time as well. And what I want you to do is when you have a chance is to go upstairs and see the fire arrows because they were done exactly at the same time as the Corvette in 54. So Chrysler had the same great ideas of doing a, a really nice looking personal car at that same time. But for some reason, Chrysler management was so conservative that they didn't go on. But of all the three cars, the Corvette and the Thunderbird and the, the Dodge Fire Arrows, probably the Chryslers were the most advanced cars. They dropped the ball and didn't do anything with it. It was only the drive of the guys at GM that made the whole thing happen. And in spite of this success of the Ford Thunderbird, they wanted to stay the course on building a real sports car. So management said to Harley Earl, we want you to design the new C2. And it has to be a car that's going to compete with the Thunderbird. So this was Earl's concept in 1956. And you can see a lot of the front end transferred over to the 58s. So this was actually going to be the Corvette at one time. But once the car was done, he took management's, answered their questions, built the car. It's very much like a concept car that he'd done with Pontiac um, called the Golden Rocket. So you can see the split window in it. Now that split window that you see on that car came from a lot of different places. And we'll see how it returns. But actually, the first place that it really came from was the uh, Atlantic Coupes that uh, were done with Bugatti in 1937. But the car that really influenced Harley Earl to do the Golden Rocket and to do this car is also upstairs, if you go up and see it, it's the Bat 7. And it's done at that same time. I mean, these guys in Italy were so far ahead, you know, with concepts and form. Uh, and if you get a chance to you know, see what, what else, what other people were doing. There was a lot that was done, but again, that money thing cut the thing off. But it was, again, the desire to build a great sports car. So we got Harley Earl to come up with a concept. We've got Ed Cole, head of engineering, 
came up with the first overhead valve V8s, you know, with the 49 Oldsmobiles that raced in the Mexican road race that all appeared in the first Cad Allards and stuff that were running. So that was where there, there was a lot of impetus from the engineering standpoint as well that was going to carry over. Of course, the thing that really changed it all was when Zora Duntoff came to GM. He saw a chance to uh, really take off and do something great with GM because he'd seen the little 54 uh, Chevrolet with a six cylinder and the two speed automatic, you know, that was just hardly a sports car. Talked his way into General Motors through Maurice Ollie, who was a very famous suspension designer. Um, went to work for him, convinced him that he could do a real sports car. Earl realized that the car that I showed you a little bit earlier, that C2 concept, wasn't going to make it. I mean, he tried to take it over to Oldsmobile and sell it because Chevrolet wasn't going to buy it. They wanted to stay the sports car course. Pontiac didn't want it. Oldsmobile didn't want it. They'd seen the failure of the Corvette. So that whole project was going down the tubes. It wasn't going to go. But he had, he was right on the edge of retiring. Bill Mitchell was the heir apparent for General Motors coming in. And he said, Bill, you're going to have to take this project on because I can't do it. But I've got one thing I left want to do. And that's, I'm going to work with uh, Zora and build a, build a new car to show really what sports cars could be to management. So they did a hurry up program and uh, built this car. They call it the Duntov SS, but really it was Harley Earl's car as much. And the guy that was behind the thing that really made the, the whole thing come together was a fellow named Tony Lapine, a Latvian uh, engineer, designer, uh, that was working at GM, and he suggested uh, to Mr. Mitchell, because, uh, uh, excuse me, to Mr. Earl, that uh, they should use a 300 SL chassis because they could, it was the most advanced space frame that they could work with at that time. Uh, Earl had uh, decided at first that the best sports car in the world at that time was the D Jaguar, and they had one rolled into the studio. And the only reason he didn't like it was because it had the semi-monocoque body on it, and he couldn't change it around very much. He was going to be stuck with the overall design on it, and that wasn't what he really had in mind. So when Lapine suggested that they should work with a 300 SL, because they had one also there as a car to, to compare with, uh, it was a really neat space frame fat chassis. And it had this monstrous six-cylinder engine in it because when it had been designed clear back in 1954, uh, Mercedes didn't have enough money to do both the 300 SL and a brand new engine for it. So they took the standard sedan engine, laid it over at the side, but it was this huge lump of an engine. So it was pretty easy to take Ed Cole's V8 engine and drop it in the chassis. Duntoff didn't like the swing axles that were on the back of the SL. So they cut it off right behind the seat, and he designed the new rear end on it with a DD owned rear end, and then they clothed it in this body. So this was going to be both a concept show car for Harley Earl, and it was going to be the world's best race car for Duntov. So Mitchell, of course, uh, was pretty excited about the whole program. But the problem was is that when they took it down to Sebring, it was late getting there. They'd uh, built up a, uh, uh, a prototype of the car in fiberglass, took it down there, and ran it. And it was really, really a fast, fast car. They, in fact, uh, Duntoff had contacted uh, Juan Manuel Fangio he didn't, to come and drive the car, and also Sterling Moss. And they both tested the car. And they both broke the lap record with it at Sebring in 1957. But the thing would only run three laps. It would go out, warm up one lap. It would break the lap record. And by that third lap, the brakes had failed because they couldn't get anybody at General Motors to believe in disc brakes. Jaguar had already proved, starting in 1955, winning with the Jaguars at Le Mans, that that was the way to go. But they could not, again, because of dollars, they couldn't convince anybody to do it. So the car was put together with a combination Alpin brakes and Storm metallics and they just got so hot after three laps they'd come in and pull the brake drums off and the springs would just fall out a piece on the ground. So it was a 
very unsuccessful car from the standpoint of the technology of the brakes. But chassis-wise, it was very good. So the other thing that was happening at that time, because of the problem with the Corvette, the sales were very poor. They pretty much cut the program off. And they instituted uh, what was called the AMA ban, the American Automobile Manufacturers Association got together uh, and decided that they were going to cut out all performance in Detroit. So Ford, Chrysler, even, you know, American Motors, they said, okay, we're going to get rid of all performance. We're spending too much money here, and uh, we're not going to continue with the, uh, with the program. Bill Mitchell said that's not going to happen. He decided on his own that whatever happened, he was going to continue with the Corvette program in secret. He had gone over to Turin in the summer of 57 and had fallen in love with the theme of this car. As you can see, it has a fairly crisp belt line all the way around it, but the most important thing is that it's got these four dynamic shapes over the wheels. And there were a whole bunch of these streamliners. You know, Farina had done some, Stangolini had done some, um, but most important was Alfa Romeo. This car had already been out two years but it was the first time that Bill had a chance to see it. And you can see right there, that is the whole inspiration of where the Corvette came from. So when Bill came back from the summer of 1957, he was running into the problem with politically within General Motors with the AMA ban that the Corvette had been killed off. That was the end of the program as far as management thought. But Bill was gonna continue with the idea and he wanted to build a new car on this idea but he could not take the project upstairs to the normal design studio with Claire McKeegan, who ran the Chevy design studio. Couldn't take it up there because if he walked up there and, and said, guys, I want to start working on a new Corvette, obviously top management would have seen that program in, in progress and he could have lost his job on it. So when he came back, he decided that he was going to do the project in secret so he came downstairs where they put all the new young designers like myself in a place called Research B where we were normally designing concept cars far out. Basically concept cars at that time were an idea where you could come up and top management could come down and occasionally see what you guys were doing and uh, see where they were going to slot each of these designers in there. So I'd been there just about six months in Research B and in walks Bill Mitchell and uh, sits down, takes off his sport coat, motions all the guys over. And I mean, we were just blown away. Here's the vice president of design, and he's going to talk to us young designers down there. So he hauls out a bunch of pictures that he'd taken when he was over at Turin and starts laying them out and talking about how exciting this new form is that he'd seen over in Italy. And, you know, we were all sort of looking at each other, wondering, you know, what's this man talking about? Is this his telling us about his summer vacation or uh, just, you know, but as he warmed to the project, it was obvious that he was going to do a new Corvette. And it, again, everything is so secret back there. We didn't know really the pro project had been killed off by management, but there were rumors that were circulating around that the Corvette has already been dead. And as Bill talked about this more and more, we could see that he confirmed that the Corvette program was going to be killed off. But he said, literally, and he said, you know, kind of crude guy, he said, I'm not going to let those son of bitches kill the car off. We're going to build a new Corvette, and I want you guys to be part of it. And we all looked at each other. We're startled, you know, why us? He must have the same thing. He's probably going around to every studio telling them the same thing. But he couldn't do that because the word would have gotten out. So he decided that he was going to try this idea downstairs and have us work on it. So he said, this is the brief for us. We want to work with this line that goes all the way around the car, this real crisp line that you see right here on the production version that came out, 63, and these four shapes over the fenders. He says, you can do anything you want, but that's the theme I want to work with. So we had our, the walls plastered with, with all kinds of sketches. And he'd come down and take a look and see what we were doing. And it's, uh, 
Let's go to the next one. You can see here again, this is a concept development sketch, and that there were literally dozens and dozens of these sketches over a period of several weeks that came up, and of course this stuff was taken down and usually trashed, but luckily I was able to save a few of them, and a couple of the other designers were able to save a few as well. And of course it was not approved to take anything out of filing at that time, because it was very, very secretive. So in the end, just to tell you what happened, we went back to General Motors and said, we've got some great sketches from that period. I think that historically, you know, you'd like to have them. Uh, can we exchange some of these photographs so you can put them back in your archive? And we'd like to have some photographs of some of the cars that we worked on at that period of time. So in doing the Corvette book, we were able to get into GM's archives and get some of those pictures that you'll see in the book of that C2 that Harley Earl did that was, uh, was not uh, accepted. But anyway, as we went along, there were a number of different variations that we had to think of at that time because there was no definite idea what the Corvette was going to be because management wasn't on board with the idea. So Mitchell wanted to keep the same idea, front engine, wanted to keep the thin line all the way around, wanted to have the shapes over the fenders. Duntoff wanted to build a mid-engine car. Cole wanted to build an air-cooled mid-engine car because he just died the, been the design head of the Corvair project, so they were very excited with that. So we had really three different areas we were working on, and as you can see in the book, with all the different projects we were doing, uh, we had mid-engine cars, we had air-cooled uh, rear-engine cars, and of course, Mitchell's car with the front engine. So. Here is some of the uh, uh, mid-engine Corvair concept. Interestingly enough, if you look at the Roman numeral on the back, it says number nine. At that time, I was really wanting to go racing in the car that I really lusted after at that time it was the Mark IX Lotus. So Frank Costin had designed that car, and of course it had fins on it. Virgil Exner had designed all the Chrysler cars with fins on them as well. So that was the real theme that was could be seen in the world at that time. Mitchell came and said, we're not going to have any fins on any cars we do because that's what they're doing over at Chrysler. And Chrysler was beating their head in. I mean, that was the most exciting car, if any of you can remember, in 1957 when they came out with the fins on it. It was the ad theme on it was that suddenly it's 1960. And Fins were everywhere, so part of the things we were doing, we were having a lot of fun downstairs. It was every idea that you could think of in, in terms of fins, and if you know what, say, Chevrolet did in 59 uh, with the gull wing fins on the back end like this and the flat fins, and uh, the Buicks with the fat, flat fins on them, uh, everybody was looking for a, a, a really wild theme on it. So a lot of our cars went on and went that way. But I pretty much stuck with this thing, and, and I was trying to get a lot more curvature in, the, in that line that went around there, but we still have the same idea of the, the fins of the uh, aerodynamic shapes over the wheels and the lines that went all the way around the car. So we kept getting closer and closer, and then finally, Mitchell came in, and I'd done this sketch in November of 57, and came in and he said, okay, that's the sketch. You guys, all right, all of you, this is the one I want you to beat because we had four young guys in there and he tacked this one up on the wall and our goal at that time was to do something better and we kept coming up with all these different things but Bill kept coming back to this particular design and as you can see, it's very, very close to what the production car finally ended up with. But it was going to be a pretty expensive car to build and even though that we got it up to full scale, that's myself and Bob Reiser, the studio head at that time, uh, in uh, 1957, and the little sketch down at the bottom, you can see it, we got the thing up to full scale on it. And finally, Mitchell walks in one day and he says, uh, just cut the roof off because we're not going to be able to build this thing. And we're going to take Harley Earl's Dontov car and we're going to build a new car on it. So that's where the whole project started on building Bill Mitchell's racer. 
So there's the same car with the roof cut off, and that's Bill Mitchell sitting in it with one of his tailored little race suits and his you know, matching hat and everything on it. But uh, there is the concept, all those lines, you can see exactly where they came from in Turin in 1957. So from the summer of 1957 to 59, when the car was you know, first race, those are the lines. They all came out of Italy because of his passion for the automobile. Now, the car is still secret. So the only way that he can get the thing built is he's going to build a secret studio because we can't do the entire thing down in Research B. So he goes upstairs, and there's a, again, because of all the secrecy within General Motors, all the workmen that come in every day, they can't bring their own tools in and go in and out because it'd be an incredible security problem. So all the tools are kept in a, an armory upstairs, and each of the workmen have a little tag with a number on it, and they, they take out all the little tools and stuff that they're going to need to work on that day, whether it's woodworking or clay or whatever it is. And uh, they call that room the hammer room because it, all the tools were kept in there. What well, Mitchell did, it was a fairly large room. He had the thing cut in half, had a false front put on it, and you walked in the hammer room, and there was a secret door, and you walked in the back, and there's a studio in the back that became Studio X. And that's where this car was, was done. At that time, he brought in Larry Shinoda, a good friend of mine, and Tony Lapine, who had suggested the original chassis number. Tony was actually a Mercedes mechanic before he came, a factory, train, uh, factory trained Mercedes mechanic. And of course, nobody knew anything about space frames or race cars or anything, so he suggested uh, the chassis underneath that car. So we used that chassis to build this car. Again, Bill Mitchell is totally, totally focused on what cars are going to look like. Performance is not the thing that's really the most important with him. And I was trying to explain to him, because I knew a little bit about automotive aerodynamics at that time, and I tried to explain to him that uh, the lines on the car were not going to be too successful, that uh, we were probably going to have some lift at the front end and serious lift at the back end because that crisp line that went all the way around the car tailed off at the, at the back in sort of the old traditional aerodynamic teardrop shape. And of course, when I was thinking about it at that time, I'm trying to tell Bill Mitchell, who's the vice president of design, this guy's been working at GM since before I was born, you know. And I kept trying to, you know, nicely say that. And he finally comes over and he puts his arm around me and says, kid, he says, I want you to know that I designed the Corvettes around here. Now just do what the hell I tell you, all right? So we designed it the way he wanted. And we had problems with the car aerodynamically. But it was such a hit aesthetically with the public that he got management to believe in the project and to revitalize the whole Corvette program again. But they said, when he first came out, they said, we'll allow you to run the car, but you're going to have to run it on your own nickel. You cannot put the Chevrolet name on it, and you cannot put the Corvette name on it, because we're not going to tell the public that we're going to get in this. If you want to do this on your own, we realize we're going to test it with the public so he put the name Stingray on it. He was an avid deep sea fisherman and loved that uh, particular aspect of his life. And that's where the Stingray name came from. So before the car had the Chevy name on it or anything else, it was the Stingray. So that's what we continued with. And uh, uh, the uh, car, when we first ran it uh, with Dr. Dick Thompson back at Marlboro, uh, it was really, really fast, but again, they hadn't changed the brakes on it. So the thing would hardly stop. The front end comes off the ground at about 140 miles an hour, and he's all over the track running into other people. In fact, he ran off the end of the track, got clear up sideways on it. The fans had to go over and push him back down on the ground. And of course, the SECA officials saw that. They black flagged him and banned him for bad driving for 90 days, but it was really the fault of the car. But if the development had gone through on the car, it really had tremendous potential. 
And uh, unfortunately, it, uh, it, it, that didn't happen again. Dollars con confirmed what was going to go on. And so by then, management said, OK, it's a great project. We'll go back and we'll start working on this car. And again, this was worked on up in Studio X. And what's really interesting about some of the photos and stuff that we have in the book is that you can see this is a clay model. There's some little jacks underneath the front, front end of the, uh, the back end of the car there. But the most interesting thing is if, if you look up on the roof, there's a man standing on the roof up there, right there, and right there. And what he's doing is he's looking for spies, guys that are flying over in airplanes, because this is in, a, in the stylings courtyard. So he's keeping an eye out. And this fellow right here, he's got a giant tarp. So if the guy on the roof sees airplanes coming in, he yells at and all the cars are covered up. Because they had to take the concept cars outside and look at them outside from a distance. Because no matter how you work on it, even if you get a fairly large studio, the cars never look the same until you get them out on the road or compare them with other automobiles. So that was the whole purpose of this big styling courtyard. Uh, at GM. So when they take them out there, they had this big secrecy thing. Now they're going to have a lot more problems because a drone can sneak up on you really quickly. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so this is what happened. Uh, the car went back. Uh, it got approved for production simply because of Bill Mitchell. If it hadn't have been for Bill, uh, we'd never see the Corvette again. So uh, it's really what he did. And this is what we ended up with. And this car uh, was pretty much uh, done in its final form by uh, Larry Shinoda and, and Tony Lapine. But if anybody asks, you know, who designed the 63 split window, it's Bill Mitchell. Because uh, he's the guy that really had the inspiration and uh, stayed with the theme that he loved on the car, and it's become an American icon. And if it hadn't have been for Bill, none of us would be here. So we have to really thank him. Thank you. What we like to do at, at this part of, of the presentation is um, ask our speaker uh, half a dozen questions uh, to give uh, some further insight um, about their automotive passion. So, um, Peter, you have the opportunity to go around the world and back in time and put five cars in a transporter. Your top five favorite cars of all time. What would they be? Well, first I'd, uh, I'd go down the road down here, down to uh, the Los Gatos area, and I'd, uh, I'd steal John Mozart's 8C2900 by Turing. That, I think, is probably the epitome of great, great design. You know, you have to separate cars by era. But that was the first car that Turing did on the HC2900. And it was built on the Grand Prix chassis at the time. They only made about 50 or so. Any one of them is a fantastic automobile. But Mozart's was the first one that was built. And every detail on that car is uh, probably the best. So I think, I really think that's one. Of it. Second would be, um, surprisingly, Alfa Romeos have always been the cars that have sort of had the passion that. Uh, uh, really lit my fire. So the second would be uh, uh, Giorgetto Giugiaro's Kangaroo. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful little uh, coupe that uh, he did uh, back there when they were doing the Alpha Romeo uh, TZs and stuff. But his was absolutely the best. And if you look at that car, uh, even though I hadn't even seen that car at the time, it's quite close in form. Uh, to the car that I did for, for Shelby, the Daytona Cobra Coupe, except his is much smaller and far more elegant, just so beautifully done because they had a chance to really model it. When we built the Daytona Coupe, it was built in 90 days, and it was really rough. We put it together in a real hurry. Uh, third, I think, um, if you went upstairs and looked at the bats, I think that is probably the most exciting car from the standpoint of just wild styling. Uh, great, great lines. If you, you can walk around, look at that car from any angle, and it's, it's pretty exciting. The Bat 7 is 
really a really wonderful form. And it's got the split window in it, and that's exactly the car, if you go up and look at it, that uh, Harley Earl copied for the, uh, uh, the Golden Rocket that he did at, uh, at the concept. Uh, the next car would probably be the 1913 Indianapolis winner uh, that Peugeot did. And this car has a fabulous history on it because it was the car that was the real breakthrough in uh, automotive engine design that uh, pretty much led everybody else, whether it be Bugatti or Myron Drake or Miller or any of the, any of the great racing engines that are out there, all came uh, from the 1913 Peugeot. And there's a long, long story on it if you can get a chance to, to look into it. Uh, but there were three young men that were all sort of race drivers at that period of time, and one of them was actually the chauffeur uh, for the Peugeot family. And he convinced them that he had some ideas to build this exotic race car. And he and the two friends had come up with these ideas, and they had to get an actual engineer to draw the thing up that they wanted. But they came up with the idea for dual overhead cams and, and uh, individual port injection and, and uh, hemispherical combustion chambers, things that had never been done before. And because of his closeness and being able to converse with the, uh, the leaders of the Peugeot family when he was driving, they decided to put a little money behind him and allow him to build these cars. And of course, they went over to Indianapolis in 1913 and won with the cars. But the interesting thing about it was that, of course, Peugeot had their entire engineering department, and they heard about this project that was being done off in secret. And they were livid because these guys were not trained engineers. They hadn't gone to college. They didn't know anything about engineering or anything. So they called them the charlatans. But anyway, they changed the world. So I think that's also would probably be number five. And number six, I'd have, have a great, great car just to drive the day every day on the street. And I don't think there's anything out there that's as technically advanced uh, and well done as the new C7 Corvette. So that'd be my six. Um, now probably the difficult part. Yeah. So your, um, your transporter is heading uh, across the plains and it breaks down. And you have to take one car out to continue going, and you cannot go back. <coughs> I'd have to stay with John Mozart's Alpha. I think that's, that's it, you know. I don't think I disagree with you on that one. <laughs> um, what car would you like to drive coast to coast, whether a, a leisurely uh, Route 66 style or a Cannonball Run style? Well, I had a chance to run the Cannonball, so uh, um, the way to win the Cannonball is you do that with the stealthiest car that you possibly can. But if it was going to be a leisurely uh, cruise across the United States, I don't think there'd be anything nicer than a 66 Caddy convertible, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that's really silent. It's just, you know, if the 59 was a little bit too garish and over the top done by my friend Dave Holes, but they backed it down in 60, and I think that's, the epitome of the Finn era, at least for General Motors. We had some great ones out of Chrysler at that time as well. But boy, I'll tell you, seeing you know, any one of those uh, uh, 59, 60s caddies, boy, they're, <laughs> they're really styling if you want to go leisurely. If you want to get in a hurry, uh, the way we, uh, we ran it, we ran it in a uh, very unobtrusive Mercedes sedan and probably would have won it if we hadn't got stopped in Riverside for 12 minutes to let a train go across. So we lost it by 12 minutes. But <laughs> if, if you could, which automotive personality from history w would you like to meet, whether over lunch or to go for a drive with? This goes back again to uh, my respect for uh, a, a fellow that I've met a couple of times and had lunch with. And, and his designers. So it's actually a, a combination of people. And that would be Gordon Murray, who I think is the world's best automotive designer. And his, he's such a good designer that he even hired his own stylist, which is Peter Stevens, another guy that I have a lot of respect for. So they did the, uh, the McLaren F1, which I still think is probably the greatest supercar done. There are many cars that have been done since then that have 
theoretically more performance, but better overall driving car, I think it would be the uh, uh, Gordon Murray. And he's a fabulous guy because he just uh, doesn't make any compromises in anything that he does uh, in terms of weighing every nut and bolt that goes into the car and how the thing is designed and then working with Peter Stevens. So he's a, a, a great engineer, a good designer on his own, but he's smart enough to pick a guy that knows how to do the right surface development and build a great automobile. So it would be a, it would be a combination. So that would be a great, great luncheon with those guys. Um, which automotive, either event or venue, uh, would you wish to visit or attend? Well, I've gone to Le Mans many, many years, of, uh, and I think that's always one of my favorites. Uh, from the standpoint of, of being able to, you know, encompass and walk around the track and see it and see all the new cars and te technology. Uh, Le Mans is all, always a, a very exciting, but my favorite racing is, uh, is the desert. Uh, now they run the Dakar in uh, South America. Uh, I had a chance to go with Robbie to Africa and, and run the Dakar in Africa with him. And also any of the of the top Baja races, so like the 1,000 or the 500, are the most exciting, challenging races in in, in racing. And, I mean, automotive racing has gotten so over-regulated uh, these days that it's almost gotten boring. But boy, it isn't in Baja. I mean, you're, those guys are running flat out for 15 to 18 hours at speeds up to 140 miles per hour over roads that you wouldn't even believe that you can drive on. And so it takes a tremendous amount of courage. It takes a tremendous amount of logistics in terms of how the crew services these equipments and to keep all that stuff together. So from the excitement standpoint, it's probably anything uh, down in, uh, in Baja or, or the Dakar events. And um, if it's on pavement, certainly Le Mans, there's pretty tough to beat. So our last question, but I don't, don't think the last question of today is, um, what's your most cherished automotive artifact? The thing that I really have in my house that I like the most is a, uh, a trophy that was presented to me by the Road Racing Drivers Club uh, called the Phil Hill Award, uh, which I received a couple of years ago. And I was a uh, new Phil when I was growing up. and. Uh, have a tremendous respect for what he did for America. So uh, having that trophy in, in my house is probably the best thing. Um, we're going to open it up to some questions from the floor. If, if you could bear yeah. with me, we'd like to use the microphone so everybody can hear your question. And I'm the person holding the microphone. So, <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll try and get around as quick as we can. So. Um, I know there's a question out there. Who wants to be first? I saw this hand. Do you have any insight about the relationship between uh, Zora and John Fitch? Yes, there was a. Uh, I went down to uh, Sebring in 1957 uh, when they ran the SS down there. And of course, John had been uh, uh, a factory Mercedes driver uh, in Mexico, and Zora had uh, tapped him to run the program for him in, uh, in 56 when they first went down there with the Corvettes, and of course in 57. So uh, Fitch was responsible for the whole, whole program down there, but primarily uh, the SS program with Zora. So they were very close, and he was certainly a, a very respected driver and a, an incredible personality. The guy was a P-51 fighter pilot, had been shot down with Germany. I mean, incredible history. But uh, so they were really great, great friends, and he ran that program uh, for Zora down there and uh, ended up uh, dr driving the car because uh, Fangio was very courteous and backed out of the car and said, the car has tremendous potential, but obviously it's not going to last long. They'd you know, seen how badly the brakes worked on the car and it wasn't going to work. Moss had had the same problem. So they both backed out. So in a, in a big hurry, uh, uh, Zora called uh, Piero Taruffi to come over and uh, drive with Fitch. So 
fit start of the car, went a few laps. Um, the problem was is that the, 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 beautiful, the beautiful version that they brought down had a magnesium body on it, and it got so hot inside the car because the heat transferred through the mag. They hadn't had that problem with the, uh, with the fiberglass body, the, the mule, uh, but he had to get out of the car and uh, put Tarufi in it, and then Tarufi went, I think, another you know six or seven laps, and they had a bushing brake in the back end on it, and the car didn't finish. So again, it was just a development problem. It was, if it hadn't have been for the AMA ban and they could have continued on that car, uh, it, it probably would have been uh, as fast as the Scarabs that uh, came out a little, little while later, because that V8 engine really did it, and they, it was quick. So just money and development. If we hadn't had the AMA ban, uh, Corvette probably would have been the number one racing sports car in the world. I have a question here. Pete, what year did you work, go to work in Venice for Shelby? What years did I work for Shelby? Is that what you saying? Yes. No, I started, uh, started work for Carroll, uh, I think uh, about 1962, I think, really got in and running his driving school for him. That's how he started out. Uh, his first, first real program is he'd uh, uh, gotten the Goodyear tire distributorship from, uh, from Goodyear when he retired in 59, and, and he had actually gone back to uh, Pikes Peak uh, to show the new tires off, and that's where he met Dave Evans. And Dave Evans of Ford Motor Company told him about this new small block V8 Ford that they were going to do. It was actually designed for a Canadian pickup truck. It was 221 cubic inches at that time. And then John Christie uh, at Sports Car uh, International told him that Bristol was not going to be making engines anymore for AC. So he put two and two together and then uh, went back and talked to Iacocca and uh, given him some engines and a couple of bucks to put the Cobra program together. And, and went over and talked to the factory and given him a, a, a roller chassis for nothing and uh, put the Cobra, Cobra program together. So Carol was really a conjurer. He was a great guy in, in, uh, in being able to uh, squeeze money out of places that you'd never think that uh, it would happen. So uh, I worked for him until uh, uh, Ford Motor Company came in with the GT40 program. We'd been so successful with the uh, Daytona Coupes that they were finally convinced that uh, they should give their real racing program because at that time it was being run by Holman Moody. All the real money uh, was going to Holman Moody back east because that's where the real Ford was spending their stock car money and of course in drag racing as well. So they, uh, they could see that uh, the Shelby program and, uh, was the one that was really gonna win. So they gave the entire GT40 program to Carroll Shelby uh, but the only caveat was that we had to cut off the Cobra program. And of course, when they cut the Cobra program off, I pretty much lost interest because that was my goal. At that time, the Cobras were fast in the GT40s. The, from a technology standpoint, the GT40s had far more potential for the future, but the car lacked development where the Daytonas were sort of at the peak of their development program and they were reliable and they were fast and, and, and that's why they won. Uh, and that's why Ford gave uh, Shelby that program. So that's when I left, when the, uh, when the GT40. Pete, the came. reason I asked, I had a 63 Corvette, uh -huh. and I stopped by your place in Venice on the way down to Clippinger Chevrolet with Bob Wingate. And when I stopped out in front with my Stingray, I went inside and you, I believe, were working on a mold for the Mustang hood or something. October 62 was when, when the two cars uh, met for the first time. Okay. And neither of the cars had yet been uh, uh, homologated for production with the SECA. But it was interesting because the, the Cal Club, which was the, uh, a separate uh, sports car racing organization out of Southern California, had not yet become the Cal Club region of the SECA, I'm just... put on their own uh, sports car races down there. They were far more advanced in their thinking. So they made up a special class called XP, and they admitted both the Corvette in 63 form and Shelby's uh, uh, Cobra at that time. And after all the work and stuff that Zora had done, I mean, he went out there and the Cobra just smoked it. 
it broke because it wasn't fully developed at that time and didn't win the race, so the Corvette won the first race of the two. But uh, that's when he went back and decided he was going to build a Grand Sport. And uh, that program didn't go either because they raised the homologation numbers and you couldn't get enough cars built in that period of time. So that program died on the vine. And of course, partly that was General Motors. They were, thought they were out of racing and all this backdoor stuff was going out. <laughs> well, Pete, the only thing I really wanted to say, if 50 years later, you asked him if I had ever driven a Cobra and they just had washed the black one. And he says, well, why don't you go ahead and take that for a ride? I think you're really going to enjoy it. Right out there in front of the place, you asked me to go take a Cobra for a ride. I'm, I'm sorry, if you're, the voice is, I uh, can't hear that really well on it. Could you ask Tim to yeah. take well, that over and, and uh, Tim? I just, want to, I just want to say thank you for letting me take a Cobra out on the street oh, just to drive yeah. it. Thank, well, you thank you very much 50 years later. All right, thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> We have a, a, a gentleman here has asked you to, to comment on this photograph. Oh, this is a, a great picture of uh, a Stingray. This is the way uh, Bill Mitchell went racing. It's a, uh, as you can see, a, a little Chevrolet towing the uh, Stingray racer on the trailer on the back. And that was a, the way he went out as a privateer uh, to go racing. Just like everybody else did in those days, there weren't any big 40-foot vans. Even the early chaparrales and stuff went around on little two-wheel trailers on the back end. And uh, actually, my friend Larry Shinoda was on the crew, and, and Dean Bedford, a guy with the engineering department, uh, they were all sort of a, a pickup crew that, that uh, ran this car for Bill Mitchell, and that's the way they towed it around. It's on the you back of a little chest. What's that? Look at the emblem. The emblem. It's only the stingrays on the side. That's all you can see on the car. On the El Camino. Oh, yes, they'd have the stingray emblem on the El Camino. Right. I hadn't seen that. That was uh, the official crew car. <laughs> I hadn't noticed that. Thank you. I have a, a, a question That's a over great, here. great photograph. I'll have to keep that one for our files on there and uh, bring that one up in the future. Thank you. Did you ever see uh, Chevrolet going to a mid-engine platform on the Corvette? Say again, Tim, can you repeat that for me? He asked, did you ever see a Chevrolet go to a mid-engine platform on the Corvette? Well, there are a lot of mid-engine programs, and, and uh, even Ed Welburn, who currently runs the styling back there, you know, did the, uh, the AeroVet, which uh, A.J. Foyt uh, set a lot of records with. But I don't think that we're going to see a, a mid-engine Corvette yet for a while. I mean, that's Corvette, when you talk to Corvette guys and you take a a poll on what they see as a car that you can use every day on the street. I think it's going to stay as a front engine car, but every time a new C version comes up, whether it's going to be the C8 or not, I'll tell you there's going to be a C8 mid-engine car concept that is going to be studied very, very closely back there. But every time it comes up, it goes back to a front engine rear drive, because that just, that is Corvette, you know. A question here in the front row. The, the guest asked if there's any concept car that came across your desk or through the studios when you were there that you wish you'd became more involved with. Do I wish I had more involvement in the concept? Any of, any of the concept cars? No. Well, primarily, I didn't get involved in any other projects other than this, this one here. And a little car that you can see in, if you look in my book that um, I can tell you a little humorous story. I got involved with, uh, used to work late in the studios at night there on my own. I just, I loved working at styling so much that I'd stay there at night sometimes on my own and work. And, and one night, Harley Earl walks in. And he's an incredibly imposing guy. He stood about six foot four. He's always impeccably dressed, you know, in, in gray flannel. And he never, never spoke to any of his designers. He always had a retinue of lieutenants that were alongside him. And he would uh, walk into the studio and whatever changes he wanted to make, he would, you know, talk with Chuck Jordan or any of these other guys and say, I, I think we should raise that line a little bit there, don't you think, fellas? And, uh, and the designer 
Oh, this lieutenant would come over to the designer and say, raise that line about a sixteenth of an inch there. We can all hear this, you know. So he walks in there and, uh, hi there, young fellow, what are you doing? Just turned out to be the nicest, most friendly guy, kind of like a, your best uncle, you know. And he asked me, you know, here I am, you know, 19 years old, what do you think about what we're doing here? And this is 1950, late 57, 58 in that area. They're just about ready to introduce the 58s and 59s. And these are the worst looking cars I'd ever seen. They were so far off of the direction that I thought that we should be going because they were just these huge chrome laden barges. And uh, uh, I told them in all honesty, I, th I thought we were going the wrong direction. I could see what was happening with all the imports that were coming in. I thought, you know, uh, we should be building a small car and this is really where the Corvair thing came from. Ed Cole could see that as well. And the other thing is, as I said, you know, we should be building a car for students. I think we should make a little car that kids can buy for a thousand bucks. I mean, with the economy of scale of General Motors, we could build a little, you know, two cylinder air cooled car that'd run maybe 65, 70 if it had to. But Macy, it's something that you could drive around, park anywhere on the campus, uh, and have a really nice, elegant little car. And uh, he said, that's a great idea, kid. Why don't you lead that project on it? And he set it up. And uh, together, he was directing it from the background. I got to design this little car called the Corvette, literally 67-inch wheelbase car that a young student could get. And uh, I still think it was probably one of the neatest little cars I had a chance to work on. But that's a concept that nobody ever got to see. But it's in the book if you see that. So, uh, Yes, back here, Doug. Was the uh, 63 split window ever controversial in the early design stages? I'm sorry, again, I didn't get that on the 63. The, the split window, was it a controversial design in the early design stages? Very controversial. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, there was a huge, uh, huge impasse between uh, Zora and, and Earl on the split window itself. Uh, because the car, as you can see, and, uh, it was all designed at the beginning from the photographs. It didn't have the split window in it. And uh, as we got pretty far along, Mitchell walked in and, and had the, the clay guys put a line right down the back end. He says, I want to put that split window in there. He says, I've got this admiration. He told us what the background was for the, on the car on the Bugatti 57 Atlantique and modeled it in there. And then, of course, Zora walked in there the next couple of days and said, what is this? piece of shit, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> and they, uh, they got into some screaming matches over that uh, because Zora was a very practical guy, says you can't see out of the back end. And it, it became literally a pissing contest between the two of them, but uh, uh, Bill Mitchell had the power within styling. He was the top guy, and even though that, uh, Zora was a uh, head of the uh, engineering for Chevrolet on the Corvette program. He didn't have the power within styling. And you got to remember, this car was built at styling, not out of General Motors or Chevrolet. This was a secret project that was pretty much paid for with stolen money out of other projects to do it in secret. So when it finally came to decisions on it, Bill Mitchell had the upper hand and said what went with the car. And his whole concern was strictly what the car looked like in terms of design. And as you can see, if you walk around this car, there's a lot of things on it that don't work. You know, you look at the, the grills on the hood that don't work, the vents on the side that don't work, the vents on the quarter window that don't work. And Mitchell would explain to us, you know, we kept saying, you know, none of this stuff works, Mr. Mitchell. Can, can we he say, don't worry about it. This, the important thing is, is that when a person walks into the showroom, he walks around the car and sees all these little details on it and perceives that as value. And we're saying, yeah, but it, it, it doesn't function. He said, it doesn't matter. You know, he said, it doesn't matter. He said, nobody's ever going to drive these things over 90 miles an hour, so just don't worry about it. So it just drove us crazy. And uh, my friend Larry Shinoda came up with the term surface entertainment. So, so that's everything that you see on the car is surface entertainment. 
But when you look at a new C7, there's no surface entertainment on the car. Everything works. And that was the thing that all the guys that work on the new Corvette program, they strove to get that engineering to work as well as the, uh, the aesthetics of the car. And that's why I, I have such admiration for that, uh, that new car. It, it really, and if you have a chance, if you haven't driven one, just go out and drive one. They are really an incredible car. So. Peter, question here on the right-hand side. Yes. Peter? Really? On your right-hand side. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah, I'm glad I came out to, to be one of the last questions. This has to do with the actual split bar on the window. Yes. And I have a little interesting anecdotal story, and I have a legitimate question after that. People thought, man, that split bar just had to go. So a lot of people who own the 63 Corvette, they actually removed that split down the window. I said, wow, isn't that great? So then people say, well, okay, this idea of not having the split came out in the 64 Corvette. The two could be identical. All of a sudden now, people are saying, wait a minute now, that split down the middle was so awesome that a lot of people who had the 63 reinstalled them, and those who had the 64 went out and tried to find a substitute to go down the back of the window. So there was a lot of love-hate relationship with the split itself. Well, that was, uh, again, that, uh, that, that whole impasse between Zora and Bill Mitchell was solved by Ed Cole, uh, who did the political compromise. He said, okay, we're going to let Mitchell have his split window for one year. Yes. And then in 64, Zora's going to get his, his clear window, which was the way the car, I designed the thing originally for Mitchell, and then he put the split window in it. So it went back that way, and a lot of people, of course, took the splits out of their 63s and now wish they hadn't because that, that car has become the whole icon of, of American automotive design from that era. That's a real Mitchell design and uh, the thing that makes the car so unique. Now, my original, now my question is this. And I thought it was very, very radical back in the 1970s, so much so that I don't think General Motors will ever done anything like this in the past or now. They, they were toying with the idea of putting a double Wankel engine under the hood. I believe it was a rear engine or mid-engine uh, concept. The body or the shell looked like garbage. But I liked the idea of the Wankel styled engine. You think that the Wankel, if you had a choice, could wave, wave a magic wand, would you have that Wankel concept, the rotary engine, in other words, be put in the Corvette. So let me get, you're talking about the rotary engine, is that correct? That was also Ed Cole's thing that took that up from the uh, NSU patents on it. And there was a lot of, a lot of development on new engines. So that was what was so exciting working with Cole, because he, of course, had done the first V8s, he'd done the air cooled, and he'd done the rotary engines. But, uh, as exciting as that engine was, they could never get the thing to pass smog, and that was one of the real problems, uh, that they could never get the thing environmentally clean. It went to the Japanese. They finally got the thing to work pretty well, and now I think they're going to return with it. They've continued to work on the ceiling problem of that, and the engine has a tremendous potential because of its size. So uh, uh, I think we haven't seen the end of the, of the rotary engine, but I think we've seen the end of it at, at General Motors. But we may see it from foreign things. Tim? I think we had, we had a question here. Here we go. Yeah, I, uh, I have to get my brain going. Um, I went to... Uh, I, I can't I, hear you. Yep. I, What's the question, Fred? Well, I asked me, I'll get, I, no. I'll, it needs a little bit of introduction. Uh, okay. Yeah, not that much. Just quick, quick question. Okay. You're going to talk quick into the microphone. Question. Okay. I'm talking to the microphone, okay? Okay. <laughs> I, I knew a guy by the name of Dave Holes. Get, get Mike a little bit closer, please. I knew a guy by the name of Dave Holes when I was in grade school. I used to draw cars with him, and I never, never, never found much what, what he did when at General Motors. What was the name again? Dave Holes. Oh, he's talking about Dave Holes. Say again. <laughs> but, um, Fred was asking about Dave Holes. Dave Holes. Oh. Dave Holes was a master designer there at General Motors, a very good friend of mine, and uh, responsible for some of the great cars that came up under Mitchell. I mean, if you look at the uh, the Riviera 
that's, that's Dave Holes. Uh, I think that uh, at one time, uh, Dave Holes was going to be the head of GM Styling. And he was, again, uh, a very, very forceful, uh, outspoken designer, very much like Bill Mitchell. And uh, management decided they didn't want any more Bill Mitchells working in there. <laughs> and that's probably why he didn't get the job and uh, ended up being a studio head instead. But uh, I think of probably one of, the, one of the ten greatest designers that we ever had out of General Motors was Dave Holes. Yes. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hi. When you were at uh, Studio X, did you work on the Mako Shark? Boy, you have to get it. I'm, I'm sorry, my hearing is pretty lousy, so I got Ask, Did you work on the Mako Shark? The, uh, the, nope. Mako was, uh, the Mako was pretty much designed, uh, again, directed by Bill Mitchell. But that car was done uh, directly by uh, Larry Shinoda, primarily, uh, who wanted to uh, uh, take all the uh, the, the great uh, designs that have been done on the uh, the Mako and put it in to the C3. So that was pretty much Larry Shinoda's uh, work on the car. And uh, uh, maybe not as clean or as, uh, as uh, some of the great lines that were on the C2, but again, very, very uh, much a Mitchell car and overdone in the, in, the, in the concept version, but uh, pretty darn nice on the production version. Unfortunately, the, uh, uh, the quality control on that, uh, that year wasn't as fine as it should be. But if you take one of those cars and really work it over and finish it all off and get all the door gaps and everything like uh, a lot of you have done, the car is spectacular. Tell the pain story. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> The, uh, there's a, a great story that happened in doing the Makos. Uh, I explained that Bill Mitchell, a great, uh, great fisherman, loved to go down in, in uh, Florida and go deep sea fishing. And um, I don't know if any of you have ever gone deep sea fishing at all, but when you, when you pull these wild sporting fish out of the water, they're almost luminescent. They just glow. They're just an incredible. And as they die, the color just fades away it's in a matter of minutes. It's tragic to see, but, but when you pull them out of the water and they're fighting, a fabulous color on it. He wanted to impart that, that color into the Mako shark. So obviously, if you've ever seen the Mako, it's dark on the top and light on the bottom. And if you ever get in underwater and uh, scuba dive and you look up, the, top, the surface of the water up above is silver. So any fish that's going along the bottom of it is silver. And if you look down on it from the top, it's dark blue. So he wanted this fade on the car. And uh, in doing the concept car, he had uh, mentioned to the guys, he brought them up to his, uh, his studio. And he had a, a marlin that he'd caught, taxidermy had done it on the wall with this gradation of paint, you know, from the dark blue on the top to the silver underneath the car. And he explained to, to both the painters and the designers what he wanted to do on this particular thing. So when the car was all done and they tried to paint it, you know, he'd keep coming in and saying, no, no, no. He says, I, I want it this way. It's got to be luminescent. It's got to be like the fish. It's, so they'd painted the car two or three times and they couldn't get the thing right. So by about the fifth time on this, you know, he went on vacation. Painters went up and stole the fish off his wall and went down and painted exactly like the car and then put it back up again. <laughs> so came back in, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. <laughs> so, so, uh, so. We're going to take two, two more questions. I know the gentleman here in the front. When uh, Mitchell bought the Corvette SS Mule, yes. And he, uh, then you and Bob Reiser designed the, the Q Corvette. Yes. And it was out in the viewing area. And uh, the coupe got the attention. But the Roadster was there. And then Mitchell took that design and the, and the mule chassis and made the stingery out of it. Yes. Now that first body was red and it was fiberglass. 
And I've been looking for photographs of that. I have no idea where the shop was that did the work on that. Was uh, it apparently wasn't in GM because Mitchell was big on photographs, and he I can't find any from that. Where did where was the work done on making the mule into the SS? It it was done in that secret studio, and even the paintwork was done in there. Uh, to get uh, all the form and everything on it because the first one was done uh, primarily in, in the fiberglass body and they took that back over to Chevrolet Engineering and it was done again, you know, under Zora's aspect in, uh, in secret. And as you'd say, when it was first done, it was done red. And then the second year, the first year, 59 is red and then 60, it was done in silver. And they made some improvements on the car. And then after the, they'd won after Dick Thompson won the championship with it in 60. Uh, Mitchell changed over from the double windscreens